Okay. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Katie Karshibuski with Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin, and I live uh, just south of Madison in Oregon, Wisconsin. And um, this is the night we usually have some sort of public engagement on um, after our committee meeting. Uh, and we always, we've always met via Zoom because we have been spread out across the entire state. So you have part of our organizing committee here tonight with us. Um, do you want to quick introduce yourself? Want to start with uh, Carrie? Sure. Hi, I'm Carrie Bauman. I'm in Dora County, Wisconsin. Um, I've been part of, um, I'm co-lead with Katie and I've been part of um, Dakota Dyslexia now for three years. Um, and it has been an amazing road and I'm just glad to have a team behind me and all these people, wonderful people to be able to continue to advocate for our children. Thank you for joining us. Misty? Hello, I'm Misty Powers and I live in Green Bay before I, I moved here in July before I lived in Sturgeon Bay and um, I did a lot of hard work with that school and we actually got them to open their eyes a little bit and they've um, started testing for dyslexia and training their teachers in the science of reading and are making huge improvements. Um, so wow. I've been, yeah, I've been with uh, decoding dyslexia for what, two years now, I think, and um, just continuing to advocate for all the children. Kimberly? Hello everyone, Kimberly Coronado. I'm from Waukesha. Um, I have children with uh, dyslexia and um, I'm here as an advocate, um, helping other parents navigate uh, services and getting um, the SLD and um, interventions and helping with IEPs and um, going to bat for um, gaining more funding and resources for children with mental health and how dyslexia interfaces with that. So here, happy to be here. Thanks. So we usually have um, some sort of a um, parent time after our committee meeting at eight o'clock the second Thursday of each month when we have our meeting. So um, this month, sometimes we have guest speakers. So this month we're having the uh, authors of the Wisconsin Dyslexia Roadmap join us, and they are, too are from all over the state. So, I mean, I could do a brief introduction, but I don't know your full titles and background. So, <laughs> um, Nikki McLaughlin lives um, here in Wanakee, and um, I met Nikki at a Madison coffee chat a couple of years ago, and we've gone to the Capitol, and um, she's uh, been trained in how to help students with dyslexia and struggling readers. And so um, it's nice to have Nikki join us. And Nancy Dressel, are you in Somerset? Yep. Okay, Nancy's in Somerset. And Nancy has many, many talents. I, You probably have multiple degrees, um, teacher, I think principal license, what curriculum director. <laughs> um, and you yourself are dyslexic. So you just have like, a, a wide breadth of knowledge and great experience. So thanks for joining. Um, and Dorothy, I, do you, ha I don't actually know your title, Dorothy. Do you have? <laughs> I'm not sure what title to give you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm retired. So grandma, mother, <laughs> well, you pick your title. <laughs> yes, and I forgot which town you live in. I know you're north of Somerset. So. Yeah, I'm up in Danbury. Yeah, and Dorothy just has a breadth of uh, a, a very wide um, knowledge of dyslexia, and you've done great work in Ohio, and uh, <clears throat> all three of you ladies have come and uh, testified at the legislature and, and things to try to make changes in Wisconsin. So um, I shall turn it over to you and, and mute. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, everyone, for um, coming to the presentation. We are so excited to join you tonight and we put together a presentation to introduce ourselves, um, to explain what the roadmap is, um, to explain how it could support literacy advocacy efforts, 
parents, um, how it can support parents and dyslexic learners at home and at school, and then hopefully also to have some time to answer questions. Um, on the bottom of each slide, you're going to see a note, and that highlights where information can be found on the roadmap. So um, we won't we spend much time on the website itself, but we wanted to highlight some important pieces that you might find valuable in it and um, direct you to where you could find more information on the roadmap. Um, so Nikki, you want to launch us? Yeah, I can kick us off. So hi, everybody. I'm Nikki McLaughlin. And um, thank you so much to Decoding Dyslexia for hosting us tonight. Um, I know some of you, mostly just by being in the same room at the Capitol, and we, we all testified together, which was exhilarating and scary. Um, so some of you have heard my story, but briefly, it's that um, my son at kindergarten, and again, at first grade, was raising flags for me that he, he wasn't learning to read. And it was like a random night in late October of his first grade year that all of a sudden it hit me. Oh, my sister had dyslexia, had, right? I didn't know anything. So had dyslexia all the way through school and they didn't diagnose her till age 17. And I hit the panic button inside my own head, like, uh, I can't let that happen to Desmond. And so I spent the evening pouring over the internet and I found Susan Barton's website, um, watched some of her videos and diagnosed him myself that night in my head <laughs> and started the process of what, what do I need to do to help him? And so I went to the school. They had no intention of doing anything differently. They told me everything's fine, probably. And don't worry, balanced literacy is going to work great. They really, really loved balanced literacy. And I didn't really even know what that was at the time. So I gave myself a crash course in what was going on with dyslexia. And we ended up selling our home and moving to Wanakee because we were in Madison. And I could see that MMSD wasn't going to change their ways. And it looked like Wanakee was doing great. It turned out they weren't. So um, I ended up learning to tutor, like um, Katie was saying. I got certified in TADM reading um, tutoring later. But I, I, I tried a bunch of different strategies. And just working with Desmond some <laughs> with these various structured literacy programs and working with him on his phonemic awareness, he started reading really quickly. And he, he, he's, a fine, he's a success story, but he's not very severely dyslexic, I don't think. He's getting diagnosed or he's getting um, assessed in the next few weeks. So that'll be an interesting um, process too. He's going for his neuropsych. So that's why I came to all of this. Um, but it was just, about a year ago that I saw that some folks were talking about organizing to make a resource that would be something like what they had done in Ohio called a roadmap. And it really was a, an all volunteer effort of just interested folks who wanted to help get some good information out there to complement um, the DPI's guidebook. And so um, even members of your own group here got together with us and we created this Wisconsin Dyslexia Roadmap that we're here to talk about tonight. And these are our goals. We really wanted to empower everyone. So you can see diversity, but including neurodiversity, that's what we're here for. Um, so I've got the one son suspected dyslexia and my other son is autistic. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about neurodiversity these days. And we know that the more resources we have, the better everyone can be included and that's why this is inclusive we want to achieve equity and this this our goal here is equity through literacy because we know that um dyslexia affects so many people and of course what some people call dystichia is also affecting many more people so this resource is meant to just spread good information um and so tonight we're going to highlight for you um some of the areas we cover in the roadmap without going into very great detail on anything because we'd like you to go in and check it out yourself we're sort of just giving you the lay of the land so you can dig in further yourself. But the resource is meant for parents, but also teachers and administrators. We, we've got sections to help with even the change management of how a, a large organization, which is what a school district is, how they can manage making a shift like a school, a school district like Madison, which is so big. And if they really believed, you know, two years ago, they really believed balanced literacy was the best strategy. How do you start to move the needle to help them make the change that many of us now know needs to be made? Um, I think I pass it now to Nancy, unless you wanted me to say something else. 
Um, so hello, my name is Nancy Dressel, and um, I didn't just add on to what Nikki said that that it was really fun creating this resource and thinking from all the different stakeholder lenses. Um, Katie mentioned that I um, have a lot of different stakeholder experiences. I um, am a UW trained uh, elementary educator and a Wisconsin trained principal and director of curriculum and instruction. Um, and I spent 20 years working in Wisconsin public schools um, in various roles, a library media specialist, an instructional coach, a curriculum specialist, um, always in leadership roles, looking at system perspectives. Uh, I also served on a school board and um, am currently on two other boards for different organizations. Um, my first introduction to the word dyslexia was in one, one college course. Um, in my preparation for elementary education that certified me to teach reading. It was briefly mentioned in one course. Um, then I didn't hear the word again until um, my child's optometrist confirmed that their eyesight was not contributing to their reading difficulties and recommended the um, book Overcoming Dyslexia. And we spent a solid seven years after that um, before we were actually able even to access a a proper evaluation for dyslexia. And um, it took another two years after diagnosis for my child uh, to get a proper 504 plan. Um, and then I had always suspected that I was dyslexic myself. And for my 43rd birthday, I bought myself a dyslexia evaluation. Um, and that was the best birthday present I ever bought myself because uh, I confirmed that I'm severely dyslexic. So I have average reading comprehension, but my oral language skills is a product of high oral language skills. And uh, my, my phonemic fluency is uh, in the first percentile and my reading fluency is in the fourth percentile. Um, and that knowledge has empowered me to choose um, a job setting that is the best for myself and choose the tools that are best for myself um, and be a much better advocate for my children. And so we offer this resource to promote equitable access to learning for all Wisconsin learners, including dyslexic learners, um, especially because they exist, they're invisible right now, but they exist in every demographic and they're not currently consistently identified or supported in Wisconsin schools. And we do believe that leaders, parents and teachers can partner together to ensure educational equity for all Wisconsin learners. Um, we did also design the roadmap specifically for accessibility for dyslexic people and for um, easy navigation and search. And so I just wanted to highlight that you're going to find um, all over the roadmap consistently uh, two different sections a dyslexia connection, which um, highlights the relationship between information about reading and literacy and dyslexia. And then you're also going to find podcasts and videos um, sections with the headphones. Um, we tried to be very intentional, to be very visual and accessible information, and then include podcasts and videos wherever we could. We also um, link to some resources to um, use with different browsers to uh, use text to speech features um, so that all of the roadmap can be um, read to you. Um, and currently there's about 18 pages of information, but it's organized in different pathways. So we have the big picture pathway. Uh, we have the dyslexia pathway. We also have a leader's pathway, a parent's pathway, a teacher's pathway, and then information about the authors. So the information can be explored in many different routes, but probably most powerful is the little search button up here. Um, I know for myself, if I wasn't able to search information, there's no way that I could digest information as quickly as I need to if I was reading it linearly. And so um, if you want more information about dyslexia, you're going to watch a dyslexic person type it. Um, <laughs> and you can see that it shows up on many, probably every single page, um, different pages. And so if you wanted to learn more about it from a definition, uh, you could click on this link and get right to that page information about dyslexia that's on this page. So we intentionally designed this resource to be accessible, knowing that um, dyslexic learners and dyslexic parents uh, need accessible access to this information. Dorothy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, this roadmap was actually inspired by the Ohio roadmap. I spent 14 years 
was in Ohio, the Ohio State University. Uh, I, my whole career has been an interesting path. I was involved for a long time with literacy for the deaf as a volunteer, not as a professional. And the group that I was with developed a program called Visual Phonics, See the Sound, which was a system of hand signs for sounds, which uh, we discovered much later also helped struggling readers understand phonemes. And it was this work with Visual Phonics that uh, got me an invitation to Ohio State to work with the professor of deaf education. So I went for one quarter as a visiting scholar. 14 years later, <laughs> I retired from Ohio State. I went back as a visiting professor, then they offered me a position and uh, they created a position for me to uh, direct the reading clinic. And so once I got started in that position, I very quickly discovered that words their way was not the most effective way to teach reading. And that's what they'd been using. Um, as part of this journey, um, I, I met, and I'm not sure exactly where or how, but I met some people who were heavily involved in the dyslexia community. And I was teaching a class at that time on assessing and instructing struggling readers. So I invited an OG fellow that they introduced me to, to come and talk to my class about dyslexia. Well, Ohio State is the home of reading recovery. If you don't know that, <laughs> uh, I've, I've met Kay Supinell. I have, uh, I didn't cross paths with Murray Clay, but we were close. But the LLI, the uh, reading recovery, all of these programs are housed in uh, Ohio State. Ohio State even owns the trademark for reading recovery. So they had been running the clinic. And when I saw that the data wasn't what it should be, uh, I asked them to send me to Texas and train me. And they did. And I was trained in how to diagnose dyslexia. And then eventually I went through different kinds of training. I eventually settled on uh, Orton Gillingham International and became a certified master trainer for them. When I was the uh, director of the reading clinic, my heart broke for the parents and who were trying so hard to help their kids. We had a diagnostic arm there. We would give a full uh, dyslexia diagnosis for whatever the parents could afford to pay. And most of the time that was well under $300. One day, I had a mother come into the clinic without her child, and she asked to go into my office, and we did. And she told me that her 10-year-old daughter was in the hospital on suicide watch because she couldn't read, and the reading people kept giving her inappropriate interventions, and the kids kept making fun of her. And she finally decided that there was no reason for her to live. So having gone through <clears throat> enough of those experiences, this has pretty much become the passion of my life. I have a granddaughter who's dyslexic. I have a daughter who I know now is dyslexic. I didn't know it then. And my way of getting help for her was to lie to her teacher and tell the teacher that we'd had her tested. Her IQ was 130. I'm, I, I drew those figures right out of the air. And I'm willing to walk through whatever path in hell I have to walk through to pay for that big lie. But we told this teacher that we had handpicked her because this child was underachieving and would she do whatever she had to to teach her to read and it worked and she did and my daughter learned to read so 
Anyway, long story short, when the dyslexia people, I was heavily involved there uh, in Ohio, and when they came up with their roadmap, they sent it to me. And I put out a call to DDE, the Reading League, Wisconsin IDA, and I said, what do you think of this? And I sent them the link. And they said, let's do it. So we send out an email and ask for volunteers. Katie was one of the ones who volunteered. And uh, Katie stayed with us until the legislation pulled her away. But anyway, what you see here is the contribution of nine people who volunteered. Some agreed to let us uh, mention their names. Others said, no, don't mention me. But every one of them made some major contributions. So I think that's enough, Nancy. I'll throw it back to you. Oh. Thank you, Dorothy. Every single time I present with you and Nikki, I learned something new about your wealth of experience. And so I'm in awe again. Um, if you're aware of decoding dyslexia, there's no doubt that there's a high chance that you're intimately familiar with the personal costs of unidentified dyslexia, like Do Dorothy just spoke about, or Nikki or I have. Um, and there's probably no doubt that you've had traumatic experiences related to that, um, and that you notice the system costs to everyone. And so we thought that we'd start with looking at the question of how can the Wisconsin Dyslexia Roadmap support literacy advocacy efforts. So we're going to start by highlighting um, a couple of resources that are available. Um, you guys know better than anyone that we talk to that there are a lot of barriers to overcome. And a lot of times it feels like a, a stone wall that you're trying to climb over. And it's usually in the form of other people who speak with certainty or authority and you know, binary black and white thinking or judgment or being dismissed, you having your concerns dismissed or being completely overwhelmed. Um, and there's also the common human experiences of implicit bias and confirmation bias that are always getting in the way of sharing um, not new information, but this accurate information. Um, but we also know that we can build bridges and we can one, one conversation at a time, one relationship at a time. Uh, we can take the stones that are in the walls and the barriers that we encounter and, and move them one at a time to build a bridge. And the current system failures that we've all experienced um, really have to do with varied levels of knowledge about evidence-based reading instruction and assessment. And um, I don't think there's anyone in the system that is intentionally trying to harm kids. Um, and just coming to the roadmap and sharing the roadmap with that lens, I think helps us have compassion and empathy for all stakeholders. Um, I personally have been a teacher who has supported teachers using balanced literacy. I've been a curriculum person who um, supported the process that adopted balanced literacy. And I can honestly say that every person involved in it thought they were doing what was the best thing available at the time for kids. And we know differently now, and we need to keep sharing that information so more people can do better. Um, and we can address the grief and trauma that is triggered by the experiences of this and by learning it. Um, so a foundation of the roadmap is this shared belief that leaders, parents, and teachers can partner to ensure educational equity and achievement for all learners, including dyslexic learners. Um, and so we are going to highlight some of the resources that can support that. One of them is right on our homepage, we highlight that uh, through legislation and court proceedings, there's a common understanding now that literacy is a civil right, all the way back to Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. And we also believe that achieving equity for all requires a focus on working towards equity through literacy. Um, to do that, we of course, we have to be honest about our current reality. And so we share some um, very specific uh, facts and graphics 
um, about Wisconsin's current reading achievement. Uh, this one in particular highlights uh, the changes that, that Wisconsin has experienced in ranking on the NAEP assessment, which is a national assessment um, since 1992. And so um, you can see that while other states that are have different legislation and different instruction and assessment practices have either maintained um, their ranking amongst the 50 states like Massachusetts or have increased their ranking amongst the 50 states like Florida, um, Wisconsin unfortunately has been on a downward trend um, since the mid 90s. We also need to acknowledge that we have a widening achievement gap in Wisconsin. Um, in 2020, um, as you know, third through eighth grade students that took the state ELA assessment, only 33.7% of all Wisconsin students scored proficient. Of those students that scored proficient, 41% were white, whereas students with disabilities, it was only 9.7%, homeless students only 8.4%, Black students only 7.3% and English language learners only 5.7%. So we have a long way to go to address um, the achievement gaps in the state of Wisconsin. We also highlight that equity includes students with dyslexia. And 20% of our population, as you guys are well aware of, are affected by dyslexia, uh, 80 to 90% of those with um, disabilities. And what we try and highlight is uh, explaining the variations in estimates that that occurs because of different cut scores that are used, but highlighting the Yale Connecticut longitudinal study that found that one out of five people are dyslexic and only 6% um, receive services. And we also try and highlight that um, the students that the state of Wisconsin can't yet measure um, how the inequities for students with dyslexia because we don't have consistent administration and reporting of standardized assessments for word reading accuracy and word reading fluency. We also try and provide a pathway forward by highlighting that high impact instruction can overcome external factors. So if you're not familiar with um, Hattie's meta-analysis and research, um, he essentially identified uh, through studying, analyzing many studies that the effect size for one year of education is a 0.4. So basically one, a student who attends school for one year should have a, a growth or an impact of 0.4 on their learning. And then he was able to, through that, measure the impact of other factors. And so his research confirms the impact of other external factors. So it confirms that depression has a negative impact on learning. It also highlights that current literacy practices like balanced literacy don't actually equate to one year's growth. They have a 0 0.09 effect size, which is about a quarter or one term's year of growth within one year. So it's not possible to even accomplish one year's growth, much less close achievement gaps with balanced literacy. It does then provide a pathway forward though, because we can see that phonics instruction, vocabulary programs, phonological awareness, and structured literacy or reading programs for specific groups have greater than a 0.4 impact, which means you can get more than one year's growth from them. So you can actually close reading achievement gaps. And so this research um, not only confirms what we already knew, but it provides a pathway forward. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Nancy, Rung, Nancy Young's reading ladder. She was kind enough to let us include it in the roadmap. And this is a wonderful infographic that again, highlights that 90% of all learners can learn to read at grade level. Um, to me, an elevator analogy has worked really well in trying to engage conversations. Um, I think everyone now in our society accepts that um, individuals who are in a wheelchair need to have access to an elevator to access learning on the second floor. Nobody argues with that. And they also realize that that elevator benefits all students at some point, whether it's a teacher in a cart or a student with a broken leg, um, and that it doesn't harm anyone. And structured literacy is actually the same for dyslexic students. Um, it's their elevator to their equal opportunity to learn to read. And it benefits all learners and it doesn't harm anyone. And so using that analogy has really helped me be able to start conversations. 
Um, we also have some great information about dyslexia legislation. Um, we highlight that dyslexia is defined in federal law and in Wisconsin law, uh, that Wisconsin was the 43rd state to pass dyslexia legislation. So it just kind of puts our place in Wisconsin in context. Um, but then there's some really important information that I wanted to highlight about ESSER funding um, because your districts will be looking at this um, very soon because it was just approved. And so this is a great time if you have time to reach out to school district leaders, CISA leaders, and UW system leaders to ask questions. This is a great time to do that because there's funding for training for educational leaders, $25,000 for every CISA. Uh, there's also funding for school district literacy audits, um, $65,000 grants for CISAs. They have to have partner schools. So contact your schools and your local CISAs to ask them to apply for these grants and to partner together. Um, there's also $4,000 for every school district in CISA for teacher training. We have the links right to the certified providers through um, Siri and IDA right on our website. Um, so again, ask your school districts who they're going to send. Um, the, there's also funding for CISA 9 and CISA 8 literacy centers, and teachers from other areas of the state can attend training in these places. And there's also funding for UW preparation programs to do an independent landscape analysis. So reach out to your local UW. I'm going to contact UW Eau Claire, where I got my bachelor's of education from, and I'm going to ask them if they're going to apply for this landscape analysis. Um, and then also note that any unused funds um, are available to, for teacher training um, of a year later. So ask again in a year if your district's gonna apply for this funding to get training for their leaders and their teachers and for the UW. Um, there's also some great materials about curriculum. And um, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's actually a great website from the UW um, that you can search what curriculum your school district uses. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of school districts that use balanced literacy. Um, currently 21% use Lucy Calkins, 19% use Fontas and Pinnell, uh, and 12% are using district or teacher creative resources. Correlation doesn't equal causation, but it's notable that 48% of K-2 classrooms in Wisconsin are using curriculum resources that have been shown to be ineffective or can't be studied. And only 33% of third through eighth grade students in Wisconsin are proficient in reading. So there is the DPI highlights that um, that funding can be used for um, curriculum materials and training, uh, ESSER funding. So it's a great time to see what curriculum your district is using and to ask them when they're planning to do a curriculum review. Um, you guys are more than familiar with the costs of dyslexia, but we have a whole page about the costs and the return on investment of addressing it. And so it highlights two really great resources at California uh, White Paper and the Ohio Dyslexia Roadmap that points out that dyslexia affects um, almost as many students as are affected by ESL, more students than are affected by ADHD or diagnosed behavioral problems, more students that are infected by um, anxiety, PTSD, depression, and more students are affected than students who are affected by autism. Most of our funding goes into mental health right now and, and to other special needs. And we need to adjust that to address dyslexia so that we have fewer of these problems. Um, it also highlights the California White Paper that um, dyslexia people with dyslexia are overrepresented in negative life outcomes, um, whether that's chronic absenteeism, juvenile detention, special ed, prison, um, or homeless people. And again, I know you as an audience are more than familiar with this, um, but the roadmap allows you to share this information with people. Um, and it also, these, that page points out the return on investment. California is looking at saving, uh, unlocking 5% of their state budget. Can you imagine what we could do with 5% of Wisconsin state budget? Um, and the Ohio roadmap points out one school district um, that their model is that they're going to save $12 million in the next 25 years by investing in structured literacy. Oh, and that's my dog. So uh, the last thing is just that there's journeys of Wisconsin school districts. So I just wanted to leave you with hope that there are school districts that are doing things. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Nikki. 
Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I know that on the Decoding Dyslexia, your, your website, you have a whole section on educate. And so this section that I'm talking about of our roadmap is like a, it's a complimentary section on our site that it's the same kind of resources that you link to on yours. Um, so when, when I was working on creating this page, you know, I'm thinking about what, what did I do to help my kid and what would I have hoped that I could have gotten to in one easy spot. And so that's, that's what you'll see. And it, when, you know, with this and everything, if you have feedback of other resources to add, just please let us know. Um, so for example, um, in our, in the parents, um, pathway, one of the pages we have highlighted is what is dys dyslexia, obviously very useful for all of us who are in decoding dyslexia and have very likely family members with dyslexia. Here's a, a printable. So you, you click on this on the website and then it comes up as a document so you can easily print it out. So for you or for sharing with friends, family, or I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you all get phone calls and emails from other parents who are wondering, you know, could my, could my child have dyslexia? This could be a good resource with the, the usual difficulties that you might see at different ages for kids with dyslexia. Um, and again, this is something like what you have on your site, just neat because it comes out as a document that makes it easy to share. Um, also useful for talking to people about other members of their family who could potentially be affected by dyslexia and they're not even realizing that, you know. And then, so, and the next page is the whole, my section about educate yourself because it's kind of from the lens of when you realize something's going on, you feel really overwhelmed and scared. And so for me, my first instinct is figure out everything I can about it, um, mostly just to try to stop myself from feeling so scared. Uh, so what's on the educate yourself section is, like I said before, it links to all sorts of good stuff that um, I've gathered or that people have shared with me that can help you. Um, this is really, it's just a list of resources, but it links out to all the best sites that I would have wanted to, to be able to find things like um, these knowledge bases, the International Dyslexia Association and so on. Um, we've got, I think you can go to the next one again. Yeah, and decodable readers. So the value, one of my pieces of advice to any parents who think their child might be struggling is I say, get yourself a set of decodable readers even if it's Bob books and just sit down with your child, start from the beginning and go through them and figure out which sounds, which, which spellings in the books the child doesn't know and can't hear. And that will help you at least coach your child through the beginning stages of figuring out the words. So we link out to some good resources for decodable readers, many that are free or available from the libraries. And the next section is more about, okay, <laughs> so now you've got an idea of what's going on. How can I talk to my child's teacher because that's the next step my kids in school um and that's a question I, I hear from other parents a lot is oh what can I do to talk to my child's teacher and my full disclosure is always I never figured out the perfect method I I, I didn't make wonderful beautiful relationships with it with my kids teachers I, I tried and I talked but there are nice resources right now coming out I feel like there's a nice wave of um just awareness that's been happening and one thing I found that's timely is if you're familiar with Ebly, the evidence-based literacy something, this is Nora Chavazzi's group. They're actually hosting a free webinar coming up and that's what's listed here on February 24th, successful teacher and parent communication. So I didn't want to not highlight that because I found it in my research. Um, but, but Ebly has a nice page of webinars that they've already done that are free. And so that's linked on, on our site too, on the, on the parent resources page. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I, I found Susan Barton. She has, she, because she makes all these videos and she's so calm. Her presence is calm and relaxing and reassuring. Interestingly, I found that she did these Facebook live recordings a few years ago, but how to prepare for school in, in the step one video, she talks about basically baking a cake and inviting this, this child's teacher to come and talk to you before school even starts invite them for just a 10 minute conversation, which is probably going to take an hour. So she's a little, she's also a little sneaky, but she's just trying to pave the way to build a relationship with the teacher. And in that conversation, you explain, hey, I'm working with my child, or I have a tutor for my child. Here are the ways that I need you to support my child. And this, there's a second step video. Um, the free resource, I just see your question, it, the free resource section, 
basically this whole website, the Wisconsin Dyslexia Roadmap is filled with free resources. We tried wherever we could to highlight the free things we could find and then tried to mark the things that have a cost because we're linking out to all different places. But I was talking about um, specifically the, um, I think it's just called parents. I, we've talked about so many different things, but I think the page is literally called uh, parent resources, parent resources. If you want, yeah, if you want to highlight parents and then under the parents, <sighs> parent resources. Yeah, that's the page where I've got more info than you could really ever go through. So <laughs> I try to make headers and make things that make it easy to find everything. But yeah, the second Susan Barton video, so this is step one, there's a step two. She goes more into detail on, you know, I got questions after my first video. My second video is more, what are the five things I recommend you ask your teacher for? And she gets very detailed about never force my child to read out loud during class because you open my child up for embarrassment, humiliation, and potential bullying. So she gets real. I, I appreciated that about, about Susan Barton's strategy to never make my child participate in a spelling bee. Don't grade their papers based on spelling because they'll fail everything. Grade based on content. So very concrete recommendations. So you can go to the next page. And then one of my pet peeves, and I, I know it sets me off every time, is when I see a parent showing me a list of 200 words that the child is supposed to memorize and then have ready each month. And so you know that there are various ways that over the years people have spoken about sight words and professional and teachers often understand sight words in different ways. You've got the one definition of high frequency words, just meaning the words we use most often. They are useful to know, right? It's useful to know how the is spelled, for example. But then you've got this other category of phonetically irregular words. And that's what we more would think about with the heart words, words that you have to figure out because why does said have AI, that kind of conversation. And then finally, sight words, which now, and if you've, if you've studied and read, seen Kilpatrick, he'll tell you a sight word, the best definition, his definition is a word that you've already got mapped in your head so that when you see the word on paper, your brain has made the connection to the sounds of that word and your brain can pull up the meaning of that word. And so they call it the familiar words in memory that you can pull up like that. So what I've got on the site is when your you know, recommendation of when your child comes home with <laughs> a long list of sight words, whew, my, well, my real, my real advice is just tell the teacher no thanks and say that you're working with your child on words that you know, have the, that you're working with a structured literacy program if possible. But now we know how that you can work with a word in order to help a child map it, you know, sort of like encourage that orthographic mapping, which is to actually show the child each piece. So in the word said, you do this, that's normal. The d, that's normal. It's just the middle part that you want to call attention to. And so I, I linked to a video that shows one way to do an exercise to help with orthographic mapping. So we just wanted to call some of these things out that you might be able to also share with parents who ask you for help on this. These common questions that I've gotten. And all what we, we do, we'll see on the next slide that there's an accommodations page on our site. But I wanted to point out that um, Susan Barton on her Bright Solutions for Dyslexia has this wonderful um, section of how to get help. And again, really good information that you can share with parents who are just getting into this or if you're just starting to figure it out. She's got really great advice there too. And so our last, my, my last part here was just that, look, we, we created this quick start guide, which is full of, and here's lots of free example resources that you could look at as parents if you want to be checking into which assessments work for assessing foundational skills, or if you want to start working with the structured phonics, this is all free resources. This quick start guide is also something great that you can take in to talk with a teacher or an administrator, whoever you might be speaking with who needs to start or should start figuring some of this out. It's a resource of free things they could use to get started now. So Thank I think you. now, yeah, I pass it back over now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we started off with advocacy because we thought that that was most empowering. Then we switched to at home because that's where as parents you have the most influence. Now we're shifting to the hardest area to attain support supports for students with um, characteristics of dyslexia. We do hope that the roadmap um, will 
will work to change that, but we do know that currently K-12 schools in Wisconsin are the most challenging environment to attain supports for dys dyslexic learners. Um, one of the things that is very helpful to understand is uh, the two different types of assessments that are typically used in schools. One type of assessment is a standards-based assessment. Um, our state forward exam is a standards-based assessment. Many of the most common um, screeners used in schools like um, NWEA, MAPS Growth for Reading or um, Renaissance Learning. Um, most of those are standards based. So they give results to the teacher that says, do more main idea or um, practice making more inferences based on the ELA standards. There's also skill-based reading assessments that assess the specific foundational reading skills of uh, decoding. And so they assess phonemic awareness and decoding nonsense words, real words, oral reading fluency. Um, and it's important to know the difference between those um, because to be um, in a, a, a compliance with child federal fine laws, uh, schools can use a, a standards-based screener, but then they also have to use a skill-based screener. And so um, we have lots of examples of both um, on our site so that you as a parent can be informed and so that we can start informing schools that yes, we can use standards-based screeners, but we also then have to use skill-based cleaner screeners. Otherwise we're at risk of violating child fine law. So these are two of the example printables. One explains further the type of assessments. And then one of them gives example diagnostic assessments um, and progress monitoring ones for foundational reading skills. Uh, so this can help you um, as a parent figure out the reports that are coming home to you um, from screeners, and it can also help you request uh, specific ones to be used. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Dorothy because she is our expert on the brain. Uh, but not unmuting. Okay, one of the uh, problems is in schools is that teachers, even school psychologists, do not understand dyslexia. Uh, in Ohio, we actually got together and paid Nancy Mather, who's one of the authors of the Woodcock Johnson Battery of Tests, to come to Ohio for a day and train the State Association of School Psychologists in a conference because they can identify dyslexia, but they don't know how. So we thought we would include a couple of things that are not in the uh, DPI guidebook for dyslexia. One is the brain image. Back up just a minute, Nancy. Well, just one slide. Uh, this is a slide from the Hain on how the reading brain works. So you first have the, you see the word, it triggers the sound connects to the meaning within half a second you have the full understanding of that word okay now move on uh, many of you are probably familiar with shaywitz's classic brain image of a dyslexic brain if you look at the back of the dyslexic brain the part that sees the word and connects it to the sounds and then to the meaning is either underdeveloped or non-existent. And look at that little green spot. That is the speech part of the brain that is overdeveloped. And if we could see the other side of the brain, we would see that the child with dyslexia is searching all over, trying to connect those letters and sounds. If you look at the non-impaired study, back to the brain, uh, you, you can see that there is that full network that was represented by the Dehane uh, graph. Now, we also have Shaywitz's uh, uh, Sea of Strengths model of dyslexia. I've had reading specialists. I, I visit our uh, CISA uh, reading professionals meetings quite often. Uh, and they often ask me, well, how can we tell the difference 
between a kid who just doesn't have background knowledge or a kid who has dyslexia. So the seven C's, C of strengths from Shaywitz is very, very helpful. This has helped some of them understand the difference between a child with poor background knowledge or poor vocabulary, poor language, and a child with dyslexia. Okay, now you can move on. We also included some information for the schools that maybe parents can take to the schools or if teachers dig into this. This is Nadine Gobbs' uh, requirements for an effective screener because, um, do I dare say this? I think I do. PALS is not an effective screener for dyslexia. And many of our districts in Wisconsin use PALS as the reading readiness screener. Well, if you don't also include the uh, uh, comprehension, no, back up. Uh, OK, I think Nancy's trying to move me on here faster. Uh, if you don't include the process of reading, which you find in the rapid automatic naming, uh, or some other kind of process there. You're not going to identify these kids early enough. Our district, I persuaded them to buy the early bird screener that was developed by Gob, and they were amazed at how many of their kindergarten students they were beginning to, to pick up with a different kind of screening test. So we have full information on that. Okay, Nancy, go ahead. Let's just sk skip this one. Uh, let's skip this one. Uh, we decided to go very deep and empower parents and teachers to understand how to diagnose dyslexia. This is the Woodcock Johnson 4 assessment bulletin number six. You can Google it and find the same thing. Any school psychologist can use this pattern, which is put out by the test makers to identify dyslexia, but most of them don't know it exists. Uh, I'm in a fair number of IEP meetings, and I am always asked, where did you get this? How can we have access to it? And Misty just said, yes, Sturgeon Bay is now using this. And this is one of the ways that you can influence identification of dyslexia. Uh, there's a primary reading and writing difficulties, there are secondary reading and writing difficulties, and then there are cognitive abilities that are possible contributing factors to dyslexia. Most school psychs, when they test for SPED qualifications, do not give this complete battery. They give an achievement battery and they do a history, and that's about it. They do not go this deep in their testing, but you can request it. You can take this to them. You can say, this is what I want. Now, look at the bottom line here. In order to identify dyslexia, you have to be able to uh, find their ability to learn when reading is not required. And you can do that in different ways. You can get it from a, a composite a general intelligence uh, figure. You can actually get it from listening comprehension. When I was trained in Texas, they told us that the listening comprehension score could roughly be equated to the verbal IQ score, even though you don't give an IQ test a vocabulary. If they're very good at math, you've got a discrepancy here. And I hate to use that word because I know we can't officially use it uh, in identifying dyslexia. But the difference between why is a child so fluent in math and why does he struggle so hard with reading? OK, flip one more. And then this is the chart that is included in that service bulletin. And you can go through, and if you have scores from testing, from school testing that maybe didn't identify dyslexia, you can take the standard scores or the percentiles 
and map them onto this. Now, if it's a different test from the Woodcock-Johnson, of course, you're going to lose some validity, but you can still use it to get a general idea of where your child's testing might indicate dyslexia and what additional tests they need. So there are two ways that you can use this, both to request the specific test or to map scores that you might have onto this test that will give you a clearer idea. So I, uh, I'm very conscious of the time. We've kind of gone over time. So um, uh, one more thing I do want to say, be sure that you're using the same language as the teacher. I found that even at a university level with professors in the education department who specialized in reading, that whenever I said phonological processing, they heard phonological awareness. They're not the same thing. The same thing happens to your teachers because it's these professors who teach your teach teachers and they don't understand the difference. So the brain processing, as illustrated by those brain maps and as uh, illustrated by what's required in these tests to identify dyslexia, is different from how do words rhyme? Let's clap the syllables. They are not the same thing. OK, we're out of time. So I'll throw it back to Nancy. And if you have questions, why? Uh, we're happy to take them. Yeah, I think we we just definitely <clears throat> want to close with a thank you to Decoding Dyslexia and to the IDA, the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin and the Reading League, because they all contributed in different ways to the creation of the roadmap. Um, so we definitely need to thank them for that. Um, we also need support as the roadmap in sharing it because we want to focus our um, volunteer efforts on creating um, a content and keeping it up to date. And so anywhere that you can share the roadmap and if you can use our hashtags, that makes it even more accessible to different audiences. Um, we're very appreciative of that. And then, yes, we absolutely um, highlighted some great information um, and it's just the tip of the iceberg of what's available on the roadmap. Um, I know I can stick around for a little bit longer um, if, if other people are able to, to, to answer questions. Um, but thank you and, and Katie, if you wanna pop in and share any questions that came up. I guess yeah, I, I think the questions were answered along the way. Am I unmuted? Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get my um, screen back. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great job. Thank you so much for sharing all of your information. And um, Nancy, can you just show us where on the website that bulletin is? Because um, mm -hmm. I've been attending a lot of IEP meetings lately, and I know that there's a gap in, in the data that should be collected, but I'm not quite sure how to verbalize that. Absolutely. So um, that one shows up on the identification of dyslexia page. Um, so it is under the dyslexia tab. It's also under the leadership tab and the parents tab. Um, and probably um, so any one of those, if you click on identification of dyslexia, um, then it, it clearly explains uh, the difference between screening and diagnostic assessments. Uh, the difference between a school identification versus a clinical identification, um, who is required to do referrals, uh, overview of the information that um, needs to be assessed during an evaluation, and what to look for in the findings. And then it's this area. Oh my goodness, my, my time limit. I, I have a time limit set. <laughs> for how long I can be on my computer, but I'm back now. Um, so this evaluation of su uh, support resources is the section that has specific resources about the Woodcock Johnson, um, including assessment service bulletin number six. And so when you click on that link there, you get right to the document and the specific pages that Dorothy highlighted are um, at the very end of the document. Um, Appendix C, which starts right about page 27, starts right here um, on page 29. 
So uh, I always print these three pages myself and um, then reorganize the data on them uh, to help myself better understand the information that I'm looking at. Any other questions? Um, there's another question in the chat. As a parent, if you were going to your school district, what would be your main points that you would want to share with them? What, okay, what's your purpose for going? Um, yeah, can you elaborate, uh, Crystal? If you want, you can go ahead and unmute. I think I would respond just by saying that there are so many different entry points to this conversation and it's, um, it's not a linear conversation. It's a complex issue. And so I think developing a relationship with any leaders and any teachers in your district, knowing them as an audience and knowing what topics are coming up for the school board um, can allow you to, to find different entry points to the discussion. So curriculum can be an entry point. Um, uh, assessments, you know, whether or not your school district is, is requesting reimbursement for their K-2 screening assessments uh, through uh, uh, statute 118 something, um, you know, you can ask questions about funding, you can ask questions about student achievement. Um, there's, there's just so many different entry points and, and you're all going to have different opportunities for different entry points into the conversation. I do think that ESSA funding is a really uh, big entry point right now um, to be asking questions to your district on how they um, plan to spend ESSA funding and specifically if they plan to apply for the reading program um, funding that is in motion 57. Um, I think that can open a lot of doors to conversations in districts right now. I see you unmuted, Crystal. Did you want to add um, anything specific? I was just going to say, like, for us, my daughter, we've gotten a lot of pushback from teachers. I've had, like, her first grade teacher, I mentioned that she was struggling, and she just kept pushing her higher in her leveled readers when she was in first grade to the point that she was hiding her schoolwork from me and it would take 15 minutes of tears before I could even get her to pull it out. And when I asked the teacher at the beginning of the year, I go, we are aware that we have dyslexia in our family and we believe that she is affected by it. She goes, well, I can't diagnose. And I'm like, that's not what I asked. I asked if you could tell me if you see anything that we're seeing at home. <clears throat> And I've noticed we've gotten this with more teachers than just that specific one because they're so unfamiliar. Because I are. had to talk they to are. another one yeah, about um, just how it's more prevalent than you think it is. And she's like, well, I don't have any in my class. I go, but you yeah. probably actually do. You have probably okay. one in five. So, Crystal, yeah. yeah. I have had a professor who held an endowed chair in early reading tell me that she didn't believe in dyslexia because she'd never seen it. One of the sections that's here that we didn't cover is the myths about dyslexia, mm -hmm. that is uh, reading backwards. That's what they think they're looking for and it isn't. That's one of the reasons that we put the brain pictures in so that you could explain what dyslexia is. It's a hidden, neurobiological condition that impedes their ability to read, write, and spell, basically. And that in turn impedes uh, fluency and comprehension. So uh, if you can use any of this material to educate them. Um, the other thing I would suggest is you can request testing. By the schools, they're required to do that. And you can take the roadmap and you can say, we've got this in our family, I suspect this. This is the battery of tests I would like you to do. And if they say, well, I can't diagnose that, say, no, I don't expect you to. But, and yeah, I don't know what the next line would be. I can't afford or my insurance doesn't cover a neuropsychologist. But 
a school site can give every single test that's on that WJ4 battery. And they can identify dyslexia, whether they, quote, diagnose it or not. So those are just a couple of the things that I would recommend you try. It's a hard battle, I know, but God bless you. <laughs> and I think I would just also highlight that a teacher doesn't have um, they have, they have influence and control about their interactions with each student in their classroom every day, but they don't have control over curriculum or assessment decisions within the district. Mm -hmm. And so, um, sometimes it's important to have that lens in, in your, uh, advocacy for your child and, um, and going to the right, the person who has the authority to address some of the questions that you're asking. Um, to, to, everyone's in a really tough spot that they're um, crunched with COVID and um, a million other expectations and, and truly weren't ever given this knowledge. Um, and when you start learning it as a professional, you start grieving um, uh, almost the betrayal of your training and you start grieving the students that you didn't serve. And those are really big emotions that shouldn't impact the kids um, right in front of you in your classroom, but they do because we're all human beings. Um, so I would just suggest that you reach out to multiple people in the district um, that can address the problem from different roles. And um, uh, take care of yourself so that you can be compassionate and empathetic for the change process that needs to occur for everyone. And for my part, I'll, what, all I would add is that um, a chunk I didn't talk much about on my the parents resources page is that there are a decent number of free and low cost trainings that parents can take to help support kids in that interim mm -hmm. because you can't always immediately find a tutor or afford a tutor or get your teacher to change. And so it ends up being, you need to support however you can. And there are resources where there are videos, there are apps. And so I listed all the things I could find that would be useful for a parent to support um, to whatever degree you're able, just from the, the first level to all the way through to programs that will train parents to tutor your own, so that you can tutor your own children, which is what one thing that Susan Barton's program does. She's really realistic about, hey, the fastest way to help your kid is for you to learn to do it. Well, okay, lady, but not all of us have the time and ability and whatever to do that. So there are like ways to tiptoe into it, dip your toes. Um, programs like Reading Simplified, where she gives away all these webinars and, mm -hmm. and things that you can print off to or just ideas for exercises to do with your kiddo that can boost their phonemic awareness ability and just ability to start breaking through the code. <laughs> And parents do have a lot of authority for boundaries of what their children participate in. Mm -hmm. um, even if you aren't able to um, quickly advocate for the things that your child needs, you can um, have your child taken out of an intervention that is an ineffective one because they're honestly better off to be in the classroom and be exposed to oral vocabulary than to be in a, a reading intervention that has a negative impact. And, you know, so, so there are boundaries that as a parent, you can um, establish, you can tell them not to use a certain assessment with your child anymore that you've uh, discovered is ineffective. Um, so sometimes the best advocacy is, is healthy boundaries also. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that we always recommend with Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin to help parents is request all of your students' um, assessment scores, mm -hmm. uh, all of their reading readiness scores, which would usually be like star or Pontus Pinal or star, or hopefully they're not using Pontus and Pinal for the reading readiness, but they probably are. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever reading scores and assessments they have, I would request all of those. And then the second thing is if they're scoring low or you have questions on those, you can just request an evaluation from the district and they have 60 days. So I'm yes. not sure 
what part of the process you're in, but my first step is always to just look at those scores and see how they are. You know, if your students, I don't know, hovering around the 20th percentile or something, it would be worth then requesting a full evaluation. Now, we should just say too, and maybe you know this, that even identifying dyslexia doesn't guarantee services mm -hmm. because the cutoff point in Wisconsin is lower than most states. Uh, the uh, percentile ha or the standard score has to be 81.25, which equates to a percentile of approximately 10.25, which is very low. Uh, in Ohio, the cutoff was 85. So depending on what state you live in, uh, you have a better or a worse chance of getting help. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't see any other. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's gone a little bit over time, but Nancy and Dorothy and, and Nikki, we really appreciate that you could come tonight. And um, mm -hmm. we will post this. Hopefully I have downloaded it and recorded it properly. <laughs> and we can post it on our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone for coming. We usually have a parent outreach via Zoom after our committee meeting, which is the second Thursday of every month at 8 p.m. and you can look on our website for that uh, Zoom link. So I'm going to stop recording.